Hello and welcome to COSC 505, Introduction to Programming for Engineers and Scientists. Today we're going to talk about our loops in Python. So everything we've done up till now has been execute this code, this code, this code, and we just start from top and work our way to the bottom. Now we've seen how we can conditionally execute code, so if there's some code that we don't want to execute based on a certain condition, we saw using an if statement how we can say, no, we don't want to execute that code. But what if there's code that we want to repeatedly execute until some condition is satisfied? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to understand how to execute code repeatedly using what is called a loop. We'll understand the conditions necessary to repeat the code, and we'll be able to construct a while and a for loop. Those are the two separate types of loops that we have inside of Python. We'll be able to optimize code and remove duplications because the whole thing is, is we're, you're never going to have code that just sits there and stays the same. Now, in maybe in the science realm, that does happen where you still have the 1970s version of whatever software you've got. But hopefully it's maintained, it's updated, that sort of stuff. But if I have something placed everywhere, I sort of have to do a control find and replace to replace all of those different instances of something. Well, if we can remove duplications where it's not necessary, we can just change it in one place and it changes it for the whole program. We'll be able to break out of a loop using the break and continue keywords and we'll be able to construct a nested loop. And so taking a look at Python, just like an if, l if, and an else statement is what is known as if statement and it has a condition. And that's how we conditionally execute certain Python code. With a while loop and a for loop, we will repeatedly execute certain code. So let's take a look at what a while loop is going to look like. So a if statement, for example, this, if true. So you remember in an if statement, if the condition is true, which I just put true, so the condition has to be true, it's going to execute the code. So if we ran this, we would see that it would come out, run this. So we see that right there. So run this is what actually gets printed to the screen. So what about a condition? So if I do, or I'm sorry, what about a loop? So a while loop says, as long as this condition is true, run this loop. So let's change this up a little bit. Let's set an iterator called a to zero. And we'll say, as long as a is less than five, we want you to run this. And then what we're going to do is increment a by one. So we're gonna add one to a every single time. So for the first one, we get run this, a goes from zero to one. Then we run it again, because on a while loop, as long as the loop is, or the condition is true, that is in this case, a is less than five, as long as a is less than five, we're gonna continually execute the body of the loop. And one of the important things to notice here is that lines five and six are indented to the right. And what this does is that groups the code underneath the while statement, much like it did inside your if statement. So both the statements, print run this and a equals a plus one, those are gonna repeatedly execute until the condition a is less than five becomes false. And so that is when a is greater than or equal to five. So let's take a look at what this code does now. Notice we get one, two, three, four, five different ones. The reason is because the first time we have zeros less than five, that's true, so we execute the loop. We go from zero to one. Well, one is less than five, so we run this. We go from one to two. Well, two is less than five, so that's a third iteration. Then we do it again, we get three. Three is less than five, we're good to go there. Four is less than five, and we execute the loop. Well, at the fifth iteration where a is equal to four, a will become five. Well, five is not less than five. So this condition, a is less than five, becomes false. And you notice that's what actually terminates the loop. So let's go ahead and put while false here, and you'll see that we never actually execute the body of the loop, because as long as the condition of the loop is false, we don't execute the loop. And notice that the condition is checked first. Before we ever execute the body of the loop, we check the condition first. So that's how a while loop works inside of Python. And so inside of this, we can repeatedly execute code. And a lot of times we use this to error check what the user is trying to give me. So for example, as you can see on the screen, enter a value between one and five. Well, the input function doesn't allow us to error check what the user gives us. We're just saying, give us a value. And so we have to error check the value. We're saying as long as i is less than one, which is outside the value, or it's greater than five, that's outside the value. We want you to just keep asking the user to input a value until they do it correctly. And so you'll see, I give you some sample output here where I put 17. Well, that's way outside of the bounds, so it's not gonna do that. And notice I do 17 again. Well, this, this loop will keep asking over and over and over again until that loop condition becomes false. That is until i is greater than or equal to one or i is less than or and i is less than or equal to five. 
So let's talk about the for loop. So a while loop is what we typically use for an indefinite period of time. We don't know how many times it's going to take for the user to enter a valid input. And so that's what a while loop is for. So we use some sort of condition to say, okay, well, we, let's just make this condition the way it is. A for loop, however, iterates over a sequence of things. So for example, Let's create a list called A equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it's a list and we have elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. In a for loop, we can say for value in A. So to read this in plain English, we're saying, okay, open up A, which is a list, and examine each individual element. So what's going to happen is the for loop is going to go to the first element, which in this case is 1. It'll set 1 into value and then execute the iteration of the loop. And so this for loop will execute until we're done with the list. So I'm just going to print value to show you what's going to happen. And when we do that, we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And notice the for loop terminates whenever we're done with the list. Well, let's try something here just real quick. And let's print out what the value of A is. Let's say value equals 10. Let's see what happens. Notice we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this is one of the things about a for loop. So we are using the membership test operator, which is in, to see whether this value is in A. And so what we're doing in this case on line five is I'm trying to set the value of the list to the value of 10. However, as you can see, it didn't actually change the value of the list. That's because whenever we do for value in A, we're grabbing a copy of the value, setting that into the, in this case, the variable value, and we could use that. But notice that the list is essentially read only at this time. There's nothing we can do to actually set this. And so a lot of times what we'll do is we'll take what's called an iterator. And an iterator is essentially a, a number that tells us what iteration we're at. Because lists are at the value zero and go up to length minus one, we can use an iterator to tell us what place we are inside of that list. And so take a look at this. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to set each individual element after we print the original element to the value 10. So, we typically use I because it stands for iterator. And then we can use that range function that we saw way back a couple weeks ago. So in the range function, remember, if I only provide one parameter, it's going to go zero up to, but not including that parameter. And we can get the length of a list by using LEN, stands for length. So length of A, LEN A, will give us the value five, right? Because there's five elements inside of that list. And the range will go zero, one, two, three, four. So it'll give us five total iterations starting from zero, ending at four. So when we do this, let's just print it out just to see what happens when we print I. Just to make sure we are actually getting zero, one, two, three, four. So this one, two, three, four, five here is coming from the list. That's lines three through five. And then as you can see, we have zero, one, two, three, and four. And that's being printed from seven and eight. So now we are getting the list of what we want. So let's take out the original. And remember what we wanna do. We wanna print out the value of the list at that location. And remember we could use the subscript operator, a sub i. And what that'll do is it'll go to the ith iteration. Remember it's zero, one, two, three, and four. It'll go to that iteration and print out the value at that iteration. So we should get the value one, two, three, four, five printed to the screen because those are the values in the list at index zero, one, two, three, and four respectively. And remember what we wanna do. We wanna update the entire list to be the value 10. So I can say a sub i equals 10. So notice by using an iterator, now we can actually write values into the list that we're iterating through. So when we run this code, we get one, two, three, four, five, and then the list becomes 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. So we've modified the list by using the iterator. Once again, if we use for value in a, and I said value equals 10, we're, we're overwriting a copy of the value. So the list a does not change, it's immutable at this case. And so for loops, you'll typically see them bunch with range. In fact, range is so commonly used with a for loop that if we look at what a range gives us, it gives us what's called a range object. So let's take a look at line 12 here and notice it gives us range 0 comma 5. And because it needs to be a very, very fast generator that generates 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, right? And so in this case, we the Python, whenever it came from 2, so Python 2 used to just give us a list of zero, one, two, three, four, five, that was it. So it'd have to construct the list, add these elements to the list, and then you iterate through those lists. Well, that was a slow process. And so they said, well, we see people doing this all the time. And so with the range operator, we can index into it, but essentially it's going to generate one number at a time in that iteration. 
And so in the for loop, we use range a lot because a lot of times we want the index in the iterator instead of the actual value. So both of these are acceptable for i equals or for i in range length my list. What that's going to do is it'll take the length of this list and remember it generates a range from zero up to but not including that number. And so there we go. Let's talk about infinite loops. So hopefully we're good on what a while loop is, what a for loop is. So as you can see with a while loop, we have an indefinite uh, number of loops. We really don't know until that condition becomes false, we will just keep I executing iterations of the loop. With a for loop, we know here's the starting point, here's the ending point. If we use range, we can actually provide here's the starting point, and we can actually provide here's the ending point. If we do a for loop inside of a list, we know what the first element of the list is, and we know what the last element is of the list. So it's not an indefinite number of iterations. Now it could be a variable number of iterations if the list shrinks or grows, but it's not an indefinite number. And so that's when we use it, a for loop. So in an infinite loop, it's something that cannot terminate. So take a look at the screen, you'll see while true. Remember what we said, in a while loop, as long as the condition is true, we execute the body of the loop. Well, nothing is ever changing the condition from true to false. False is the only way we can break out of a while loop, or we could use the break command or the break statement, which we'll see later. But in this case, I will print over and over and over and over and over again. We'll just keep printing over and over and over and over again. Why? Because while true will always be satisfied. It will always be a true statement. Therefore, we execute the loop. We go back up to the condition. We exclude, uh, execute the loop again. Condition, loop, condition, loop, condition, loop. And it just keeps going over and over again. And this happens a lot, especially when you're first developing your feel for how to develop conditions for loops because a lot of times it's backwards thinking. Remember, the condition is saying, when do we want to execute the loop? So a lot of people think as we wanna execute the loop until some certain condition, which is the, the negative of that. And so a lot of times, if you do start thinking of that, remember we can invert a condition, we can take the negative by putting the word not in front of it. So for example, if the range of values that I want to accept are one through five, remember I did something like this, while i is less than one or i is greater than five. So that says, okay, if i is less than one, that's out of our range. Remember, we want one, two, three, or five. Those are one, two, three, four, or five. Those are the valid ranges that we want. So let's do something like this. Now I'm just gonna copy and paste this over so you can see we update i. So let's go ahead and run this code. You've already seen this code before. I'm gonna enter negative two. We enter negative two, it gives us wrong number. Let's enter six, wrong number. Let's enter five. Okay, now it worked. Okay, so notice we didn't get wrong number, it terminated the loop. Well, this keeps saying, well, while i is less than one or i is greater than five. Well, that is the positive way of thinking it. We're saying, when do we want to execute the loop? Well, in this case, it's whenever we get an error condition. Well, we can also say while, the value we get is not greater than or equal to one, so not within this range, and it's not less than or equal to five. So let's take a look at this condition. So in fact, these two conditions are identical. Okay, so while i is not greater than or equal to one and it's not less than or equal to five. So we're taking our constraints. Remember, as long as it's not in there, we wanna keep executing this condition. So this is what's called taking the negative. So let's do negative two or negative three in this case. Let's do five and notice it works. It's the exact same condition. Remember, the opposite of a greater than sign is a less than or equal to sign. And thinking of ands versus ors, the opposite of an and is an or, the opposite of an or is an and. So these two statements are identical, it's just two different ways of thinking it. Do I want to think of the positive or the, I don't want to say pessimistic versus optimistic way, but that's essentially how we're looking at it. Is the glass half empty or is the glass half full? In this case, are we executing the loop while it's outside of the range or are we executing the loop while it's not inside the range? You can see with those two statements, we're saying the exact same thing, we're just saying them differently. Okay, so a lot of times you saw, like in this loop, I have to ask for a number first, and then I execute my loop to see whether that number is conditionally acceptable. Why? Because the while loop executes the condition first. So a lot of times we have to check the condition 
or we have to make the condition before we can check it because to run the while loop we have to know what the user already inputted so we have to have a prompt however if the user gave me the incorrect information i need to actually ask them for it again so you can see line three and line six are identical that one's just indented under the while loop and that's usually not good because that's duplicating code so a lot of times what we'll do is i'm just going to move this out of the way is we'll create an infinite loop because that will always pass the condition check. And then what I'll do is I'll input a number and then by using a straightforward normal if statement, we're just going to say if not, so we're going to say if it's not in this range, we're going to print wrong number. Otherwise, we're going to break out of the loop. So let's see what this does and see what a break statement does. So now notice I only have one input statement. So let's enter negative three, it gives me wrong number, let's enter five, and it works. And so this has the exact same behavior that we had before, because now we're executing the loop. Break immediately terminates out of a loop. So in this case, break statement does not ever check the condition again. We just stop at line six and we go outside of the while loop. So in this case, we're saying, okay, if the range is wrong, we print wrong number, otherwise we break out of the loop. So remember, if the if statement is taken, that means if the condition is true, we're going to print wrong number and then we go back up to the while loop because the else statement is the otherwise condition. So it's skipped. And so then we input another number, we test it, we input another number, we test it until the if statement comes out to be false. That means it is within the range that I want. If it does happen to be false, remember if an if statement is false, we run the otherwise, the else statements. In this case, the else statement is break. And once again, break breaks is completely out of the while loop, and then the while loop is in the past. We don't see it again. Continue is essentially the same thing, except instead of breaking out of the while loop, continue will stop exactly where the execution is and go right back up to the condition check. So let's take a look at what this is. I'm gonna put continue here because that's what we wanna do anyway. And I'll put the break here. And you're starting to think, uh oh, now the break is not conditionally checked. And that is true. But because we have a continue inside the if statement, let's see what happens. Negative three, wrong number. Negative four, wrong number. Let's type in five, and it works. So let's see what's happening. So we pass, pass the condition check because while true is always going to be true, we input a number from the user. I give it negative three. So the if statement is going to be true right? Because negative three is not greater than or equal to five and it's not less than or equal to five. So in this case, we print wrong number and then we hit the continue statement. The continue statement stops the while loop dead in its tracks. That's why we never execute the break statement. Even though it's there, we never execute it because the continue statement says, okay, stop where you're at, go back up to the top of the loop. And so as soon as line five, the continue statement is checked, we go back up to the condition, we input another number, we check the if statement. Until that if statement, if that now notice the continue is indented underneath the if statement. So we're only executing the continue statement if that if statement evaluates to true. And therefore, that's where the break comes in. So notice that continue and break are essentially two sides of the same coin. Continue goes back up to the condition and runs, but it stops the body of the loop dead in its tracks and it just goes back up to the loop. Whereas a break statement stops the, the loop body dead in its tracks and then goes to the bottom of the loop and ends the loop. And so those are the two different things for continue and break. So nested loops, are something that you might see a lot because I give the example in the lecture notes of a matrix. And I can't really think of a better example than this because a lot of what we do in science and engineering, we have some sort of matrix to act upon a vector because things don't operate in this clear one-to-one -one ratio, that sort of stuff. So when we have rotation, three-dimensional space, stuff like that, we typically use a four by four matrix and a one to four vector. And in this case, the vector that we have that I use this for is for computer graphics. And so that's why we use this in computers a lot. However, this is used in science engineering all over the place. And so what we've done is I'm not going to teach you how to <laughs> multiply matrices by a vector that hopefully is already known to you guys. But essentially, I give you the formula. Here's essentially what we're going to do with this program. So let's take a look at line one through line four. In this case, remember, a list can store any data type element in there. So what I've done is I've created a, a, a super list, which we're gonna call the matrix, and inside that matrix, we have a list. Each row has a list of values. And so that essentially gives us the illusion that we're having a matrix. We have a row, we have a column, that sort of stuff. And then we have just a four element uh, vector on line six. 
and that just has some floating point numbers. Now result vector, I've initialized it to zero because we're gonna store values in there. If I didn't, remember, the list would have no elements at all. So we have to have four elements because when I multiply a four by four matrix with a four element vector, we get a four element vector. Now take a look at lines 10 and 11. So what I've done in this case is I'm gonna go row by row because if you take a look at this matrix multiplication right here, you can say on, on the first result, we're always on matrix row one. Now we go through V1, V2, V3, and V4, but we're always on matrix row one until we get to the next row of the vector. Then we're on row two, then we're on row three, then we're on row four. And so I started my for loop to go for each row. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna execute this entire line of code right here for each iteration of the, of the row. However, let's take a look at just one row at a time. Notice we go V1, V2, V3, V4, V1, V2, V3, V4. And then the column always goes one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And so we can use that to our advantage. So in this case, this is what's called a nested loop. We have a for loop inside of a for loop. So for each time we execute one row, we're gonna execute four columns. And then for each one of those columns, we're gonna execute line 12, which is result vector row plus equals my vector column times my matrix row and column. So if you look at the number of iterations that we totally have, essentially you multiply the number of iterations of the row by the number of iterations of the column. That's four times four gives us 16 total iterations. And I show you exactly how it's going to happen. For the very first iteration, row gets the value zero, column gets the value zero. And notice the column moves first. The row is always zero because the column is nested inside of a row. So usually that's what gives most students the thought. They're like, okay, what is actually happening? Well, row can't move on until the entire body of that for loop is complete. Well, the entire body of the for loop is a, another for loop that goes through the columns. And then for each one of those columns, we have a mathematical operation. We have a, an addition and a multiplication operation. And so that's what's happening here. And so you will see these a lot. Now, I don't really wanna say this, but <laughs> we're gonna to get to what's called NumPy. And a lot of this is handled for us where we, we can multiply vectors by matrices easy. Cause we're gonna be doing it a lot in scientific engineering, whatever it happens to be. And so in this case, this is just showing you behind the scenes without importing a module that handles this for us. This is what it's going to look like whenever we program it. The reason I wanna show you this is because sometimes a module will have everything you need but there will be that one instance where you're like, I need to solve this problem this way, and I can't figure out what library does it. So instead of Googling what library does this, instead, make it yourself. And so that's what I'm trying to show you. Now, this is just an introduction to programming with Python, but hopefully you can start seeing, especially as grad students, we can start seeing, okay, how do I extend my knowledge of where we're at? I now know the structure of Python. I now know what programming is all about. I know what a variable is, a loop is, a condition is, that sort of stuff. How can we extend our knowledge that way there we can actually solve any problem that's thrown at us now i don't expect you to solve problems that haven't been solved yet because that's when you work with a computer scientist to figure out how do we use a computer to do this but hopefully you're starting to see we have a lot of different things we have conditional statements we have loops we have variables we have print statements inputs and so we can actually have pretty sophisticated programs right now just with these shallow constructs that we've shown. But we'll see that Python is very powerful. That's why it's being used a lot. It's easy, it's powerful, and so that's why it's very useful in a scientific and engineering con construct whenever you're not a computer scientist. So that covers loops. Let's go up to the learning objectives, make sure everything is good to go. We can understand how to execute code repeatedly because we have two ways to do that, while loop, for loop. We understand the conditions necessary to repeat code. On a while loop, as long as the condition is true, we execute the loop. In a for loop, as long as we have an iteration, that means, remember, we have an iterator and a generator. The generator could be range or it can be a list. As long as we have more elements inside that list, we're going to execute another loop. Be able to construct a while loop, so remember, it's just like an if statement, except we put the while in front of it. Be able to construct a for loop, remember we have an iterator in, and then either a range or some sort of list or dictionary keys, that sort of stuff. Be able to optimize code and remove duplications. Remember, we did that with the while true. I think I still have it, there we go. So this is how we actually got rid of duplications. Now this is actually not the best because I have a continue here, but it works, so there you go. And that is how we remove that two inputs. Remember, we had to input something so that we satisfied the while loop condition. And then inside the while loop, we had to do another input just in case the user gave us the wrong value. Uh, be able to break out of loop using the break keyword. Well, there we go, we've done that. And then be able to construct a nested loop to solve a problem. And if we scroll all the way back down to 
This is a problem I think you will probably see. And that's why it's the, the biggest example, the most uh, obvious example I can give you is something like a matrix multiplied by a vector. And you can see with a nested loop, we can do that with just three lines of code, that's it. Line 12 is fairly straightforward because essentially what we're doing is we're taking this mathematical equation and converting it into Python. Now in Python, we don't do it all at once. We can use loops to actually go row by row, column by column, adding and multiplying everything we need. So that's loops in a nutshell. Thanks for watching.